change it and both William and Gianni say that no problem but they have to compare with me. Well not to me, to the group, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe I'll like uh, So we're just going to give people a few more minutes to trickle in. Uh, we'll get started in at uh, 1.35. So you'll just be a 40 minute session.
Thanks for joining uh, this afternoon's Court Basics Talk. Uh, we'll have a number of speakers today talking about uh, various aspects of the Court platform, uh, the Fabric XOS, uh, and the various use cases. Uh, so starting us off today, we have Matteo Scandolo from the Open Networking Foundation. Uh, he's also uh, recently been elected to the Court TST, and he'll be talking about uh, the Court platform, uh, give you an overview of analytics, and talk about XOS. So please welcome Matteo. Hello everyone, I hope you are enjoying these three days of conference and I want to thank you to be here at this talk. Uh, I also want to thank Guru that I see uh, coming down the stairs to have stolen my talk this morning. <laughs> so, uh, we made a little bit of change but uh, let's get started because we have a lot of things to, to cover. Uh, let me start introducing myself. Uh, it looks a bit different, I was a little bit younger, but that's how you find me uh, around the internet on GitHub, Garrett, Jira, and uh, Slack, so you can put a face behind that image. Um, as Brian said, I had the honor uh, recently to be elected member of the uh, TSD, and I'm a member of the technical staff at the ONF. Uh, what do I do on uh, a daily basis? Uh, I work on the Cord Orchestrator, uh, called XOS, and my main area of uh, contribution is the northbound interface, uh, the modeling tool change that we have in place, uh, usability, and the bugging tools. What are we going to talk about today? Of course, Cord. Um, we are going through a really quick overview because Guru made a, a really great job with, with his keynote this morning. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the software stack, the architecture, the data modeling tools and tool chain that we have in place to help you um, improving the network and the final services. And we'll talk about how to control Cord through his northbound interface, how to extend it providing your services and BNFs and we'll take a short walk through the analytics framework that we're working on. Uh, what is CORD? CORD is mainly a vision that started from the uh, open source community and in which the open source community is investing a lot of effort. Uh, its purpose is to bring the economies of a data center and the agility of a cloud provider into the networking ecosystem. Uh, why is that so important? Because, as we have seen in this day, uh, the network is really, really complex, and we want to make it easier to, to manage and deploy. Uh, as Guru pointed out this morning, uh, the most important part of the network are central office, so we are uh, trying to make them better. What basically, uh, really in simple words, what we want to do is to take this kind of scenario, and move it into software. Uh, that runs on commodity hardware, uh, so that you can easily uh, scale it, upgrade it, uh, you can maintain it more easily than a physical device, and you can quickly introduce a new service in the network. What are the organizing principles behind what? First of all, as we said, 
uh, we're taking the, les the lesson that we learned from uh, cloud providers and we want to take advantage of the microservice architecture uh, and bring it to the network. This can be enabled by SDN uh, to interconnect DNS and create new kind of VNS. Uh, and then we also need to support uh, legacy existing uh, VNS. The architecture, uh, excuse me one second. The core architecture is, uh, is based on top of a uh, traditional data center leak spine sub uh, fabric uh, that is managed by a full SDN uh, underlay network. On top of that, we have uh, commodity servers and we plug it in on both sides the access equipment and an upstream router to pipe our traffic. Um, on the uh, commodity server, uh, they look all the same, they just uh, have different things deployed on them. So we see we have one at the node that is basically controlling all of our pod, and we use the other nodes to deploy uh, VNF. On top of this, we have uh, an overlay network based on uh, virtual tenant networks and provided by Onos that is giving end-to-end uh, -end connectivity uh, to our subscriber. I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on this, because um, Charles is going to extensively uh, explain this in the next talk. Uh, on the software, what is the architecture to make it? Really, really, really simple. We have a northbound interface uh, with various interfaces, REST API, Tosca. Uh, we are working on Yang uh, that let us uh, interface with the system and make changes uh, in the data model of our orchestrator. Um, from there, uh, we have this concept of synchronizer that react to every change uh, in the data models and push our configuration and our changes uh, down into the, the backend. Um, either is that on or open start or uh, some kind of uh, container management or a, a VNF. Uh, before going a little bit deeper uh, in, in the architecture, we need to clear some some concepts that are uh, sometimes confusing while talking about Cord and XS in particular. Uh, the first one is a service. What is a service? It is a set of one or more, really depending on the case, VNF deployed in a container or a VM. Connected between them uh, through one or more virtual networks and managed by a controller. Let's go a little bit deeper and see what this controller is. Uh, starting from the top, we expose uh, the interfaces. We change them, we push the state to our authority state in the data model, and the synchronizer activates these states in the backend. Uh, the backend is what is going to, um, to give the functionalities to the subscriber. How is it called? built uh, from a practical perspective. We have many tools uh, and many languages and many frameworks. Uh, I'm listing some of them just to uh, give an idea of the complexity we are, we are talking about. We have Onus, uh, OpenSAC, uh, Docker, Ansible, Redis, Mass, Vagran, Node, uh, gRPC, Python, Java, Go, um, TypeScript. Angular, Django. So as, as you can imagine, managing all of these uh, is really complex. What we are trying to do uh, with Cord and in particular with XOS, the orchestrator, is to make your life simpler. Uh, we want you to focus in, uh, uh, in the network function. That is what about. We are trying to take care of all the rest of the complexity. But we still have five plus language, 20 plus tool, 50 plus repository, and all of this lives on uh, garrett.opencore.org. It's a good place to start looking in core. And it's really complex. Uh, so we, we have abstracted, and we abstracted through a data modeling language that we created. 
uh, you may ask yourself, uh, there are so many languages, uh, why not pick uh, one that was already there? Uh, we decided not to because we have some really specific needs in Cord and we want to have uh, complete control on the way you can specify uh, and extend the, the models. So we created this tool called Exproto. Um, it's there to decouple the definition of your model, that uh, means the definition of your system, from the practical implementation. Uh, it's there to, defi to define common modeling language through all the core environment, and it's there to simplify your life while defining new services, and thus speed up your DNF exploration. Also, this is really, really important for us. We want to reduce the overhead for developers, so we have a tool chain in place that will help you during the development. What is it in practice? It's based on, uh, it's based on a superset of the Google protocol buffer, so we didn't start completely from the ground, but we took something that is already a standard then uh, we extend it with the capabilities we needed. Uh, and then let you define not only uh, the models, but all the policies that need to be applied to this model uh, during the uh, synchronization phase of the changes to your backend. How does it work? Uh, it's really an overview. There is an interesting reading on the guide of OpenCore that go uh, way more in details. Uh, but we start from our model definition. Uh, it's a, a text file uh, with a particular syntax uh, and an export extension that comes together uh, with what we call an X target. It's basically a set of instructions on how to uh, understand that export. Uh, we compile this into an intermediate representation. And since we want you to have a complete freedom to express any kind of logic to that you want, you can provide us a set of ethic. Ethic is, is uh, nothing but a piece of Python code that can do operation on your models. With that, we can uh, create for you a model class that will manage your data, and we can push it to uh, the core of XOS to extend it. Uh, with a different text target, same process, we can uh, generate a Tosca definition and push that to the northbound <coughs> interface that lets you uh, exchange data using Tosca. Uh, we are going to see how this uh, UI generation works in a, in a few minutes. Uh, another X target, we can generate a model definition. It's used to auto-generate the GUI, so you don't have to uh, worry about that. We are also auto-generating uh, REST APIs and we are currently working on generating uh, YAML. How does XS look like from uh, a software perspective? Um, it's designed following all the lessons we learned in, uh, in the past years uh, from microservices. Uh, we are using uh, Docker to manage all our container and simplify the, the deployment and the development. Um, so at the top, we, uh, we can see Xstos, Kachamilia, and GUI, and WebSocket that are as now uh, our way to control the platform. Um, we have a core that is actually hosting the data model and uh, storing them to a Postgres database. Uh, a Redis container that is responsible to uh, ship notification around the system. Um, a registrator and console are nothing but two uh, utilities that let us do service discovery, so we don't need to have uh, a perfect knowledge of what are the services loaded in the system, but we can uh, extend them or uh, tear them down and everything will adapt itself. And then we have what is the core uh, of core, what let us translate the, our data model uh, into the backend. Uh, it is synchronizer, they are piled together because there is an arbitrary number of synchronizer in, uh, in XOS depending by the use case uh, you have. 
they are the guys that are resp responsible to configure our VNet and our VPN. Um, we were talking about auto-generating the VUIs. So starting from the data, data model, how can uh, we arrive to the operator access layer? Uh, it is a set of transformation um, made possible by a tool chain uh, we're working on. Um, so we have, from Xprot, we can generate a bunch of uh, different format and expose uh, all the REST interface you uh, need to control the, the system. Uh, let's go a little bit in detail through them. Uh, REST, it is a combination, like many other things, of uh, auto-generated endpoints that let us perform uh, um, a regular operation on, uh, on the models and handcrafted endpoints. We are trying to keep them as limited as, uh, as possible, but they gave us uh, uh, utilities like authentication, uh, um, and description of the data model, and in case your service need uh, a particular endpoint, you can uh, provide that functionality. How does the, the tool chain transform Xproto uh, into a web server? Uh, we convert them uh, in Protobuf, we expose them uh, into a gRPC server. This part here on the left is common to all of our in, uh, interface because that's the language that the container speaks mm, between each other. Um, Chameleon is an utility that is smart enough to uh, read the, the endpoints exposed by the gRPC server, convert them um, to REST and make the translation between the two, and also to generate a REST documentation that you can consult at any time. Uh, Tosca is generally used by the operators when they want to uh, do bulk operation, when they need to uh, create many subscriber or uh, change many of them. Um, I'm pretty sure that most of you uh, have a pretty good understanding of uh, what I'm talking about, but uh, Tosca is basically um, a YAML-like syntax in which you can define a schema and then we can use the, that schema to validate and, uh, and manage our data. Again, uh, the workflow is similar. Everything gets exposed by uh, gRPC server, the gRPC client uh, read the description, and through the toolchain uh, generate our, um, our files. Uh, we have the possibility to directly load um, YAML files into the system, or the, to send them uh, through uh, a REST server. This REST server also exposes the definition, so you can consult them uh, at any time. Um, WebSocket uh, are not really used to push uh, data configuration into the system, um, but they are using to, uh, used to notify the operator about what's happening. We are going down this road um, since we, we have learned the lesson that give immediate feedback both to the uh, operator and the developer is really, really important and this is the only way we have to do that uh, in, the, in the GUI. Um, the function of, of, of this is uh, a little bit different. Uh, we have Xproto that generates the, the models. Uh, the core at the moment is, uh, is written in Django, but, in Django, but that, that is just uh, uh, technical details. Uh, anytime we save something, uh, a new event uh, is pushed to Redis, and we have a container whose only job is to listen to these, these events and propagate them to the GUI. Uh, the GUI is a little bit more complex uh, compared to uh, the other interface we have. Um, it's composed by a set of auto-generated views, uh, mainly list and form to manage your data, but you can, uh, on top of this, lay down um, custom views. Some examples are uh, the service graph that let you investigate uh, the status of the system, 
or a custom service dashboard to uh, record data analytics or do particular operation. How does it work, the uh, auto-generation of it? Uh, it happens at runtime. Uh, it reads a um, description of the data model uh, in JSON. Uh, and any time you change anything in the system, the, the UI will update itself. Uh, it also provides uh, a prog progressive caching mechanism uh, so that at any time, uh, just from the GUI, you can investigate the complete status uh, of the system. To do that, it uses a combination of the uh, REST interface and the WebSocket events uh, to create uh, an internal uh, store of all the models and an internal uh, description of all the models used to generate and populate uh, the views. Uh, by design, and this is really important for access, all the core and all the interfaces and the GUI are extensible by design. Uh, in the particular case of the GUI, we can uh, inject in different places uh, custom components that can uh, deliver us new feature, new validation, uh, new information about what's going on uh, in the system. Before talking that, I need to spend one minute about about the definition of what a component is. Uh, a component is basically a set of HTML, uh, JavaScript, and, and CSS uh, to provide um, a bundle functionality that you can uh, then use when, wherever it's needed. Uh, an example is just an, uh, an alert that you can inject, inject in different places to, for example, notify uh, a successful synchronization or an issue somewhere. Uh, you can extend any page uh, of, of the GUI with your model uh, to give information on or let the, the user quickly uh, change them. And uh, you have the ability to uh, override the service graph to provide uh, custom functionality needs. How does uh, this work from a technical perspective? Um, whenever we define a service, uh, we can also define an extension of the GUI at the top right of the page. Uh, when we deploy uh, the service, this extension gets minified and compiled and pushed to a shared volume. From there, um, the, the GUI container can, can have access to it and expose it uh, over a web server. Uh, and at that point, uh, the core emit um, an event that tells the GUI to, uh, to load that extension. Uh, keep talking about extending code. This is probably the part uh, in which most developers are uh, interested. Uh, adding a new service. Uh, why is that so important? Because is it, it is the part of CORB uh, that, that lets you enable uh, a new feature for your customer and let you do research. Uh, let you innovate the network. Um, how can you do that? Uh, of course, you need to have a DNF. It can be in the form uh, of a VM or a container. Then you need to provide us your data model expressed in, uh, in Xproto. Uh, and in, in there, you need to do all the possible configuration uh, that, uh, that your VNF exports. And then the last thing you need, uh, you need to provide us the synchronization step uh, in the form of Ansible playbook. Um, these are nothing but basically the translation between uh, the data model you provide us and your VNF uh, interface. We decide to go down this way to uh, leave the synchronizer uh, as free as possible. Uh, we don't know and we cannot have an idea of what are the interfaces that the VNF exposed, so uh, we'll give you the, the full ability to, um, to tell us how to talk with it. Since I like graphics uh, and they, they make things easier to understand, uh, that's how the process works. Uh, you give us 
uh, your VNF. That gets loaded either in uh, Kubernetes or OpenStack. You give us our model and uh, our synchronizer task, eventually uh, an extension for the GUI. Those get um, combined in a Docker container and everything gets deployed uh, on the core pod. Once the, the service has, has been onboarded and deployed, um, the user interface uh, gets updated. Now, uh, these are the slides that are uh, brand new. Uh, and they were triggered by some question we had uh, this morning during the case. Uh, how many developers are in the room? Quite a lot. Good. <laughs> and what do you do most of the time? Do someone have an answer? Debugging. Correct. <laughs> we break things all the time. We do that to provide uh, new functionalities and to make the world, the world a better place, but we break things all the time. So what do we need to work every day? We need debugging tools. We need a flexible and modular uh, development environment and we need a fast development cycle and we need validation and tools to check the, our code pool. These are the main thing uh, along with, with stability we have been working uh, in, for Cordoto and Cordoto uh, one Here, uh, this architecture, we have seen it before. Uh, as someone of you, uh, someone of you has worked on uh, on Cord, not all together. <laughs> <laughs> we know that some of you have, uh, and we know that some of you have been uh, frustrated in the past in debugging this environment because it was uh, really complex to hunt down what was going wrong and where. So one thing that we did uh, has been to add. Elk stack to our architecture. Uh, what is Elk stack? It's a combination of structured log. So we have a format in which you can define what are your log message, what is the context, uh, what are all the environment information you need to debug it. We get that, we push it to Elastic Stack, that is a really flexible uh, database. And on top, on top of that, we, we lay down Kibana. What does that mean? That now, whatever goes wrong in the system, you just access a web interface, you can filter all the logs, find your error, and resolve your error instead of spending uh, time just identifying what the error is. We are using the exact same mechanism to propagate uh, all the debugging information to, uh, to the GUI, so while doing operation, uh, you can immediately uh, have a feedback and, and go drill down to understand what the, what the issue is. <coughs> we have been uh, working a lot on the build system. As we said, uh, we needed it to be uh, more modular, so we decided to move from Gradle to Make. Um, the most important uh, feature we achieved I think uh, is that we move the uh, deployment time from three hours an hour to around one hour on a physical pod and in smaller configuration, but we'll talk about that later, uh, from around two hours to around 35 minutes. How does it work? Uh, it works on a concept of, uh, of scenarios. Uh, scenarios let you define the environment and at the moment we have four scenarios with different uh, complexity and different use cases. Uh, we have a local scenario in which you just deploy the orchestrator uh, on your laptop. It lets you try out your model and uh, doing some, uh, uh, some basic work on the functionalities and the, the translation that you want to add. Uh, you can test your synchronizer there, uh, you can test your ethic, and you can test your custom logic. On top of that, uh, we have a mock scenario uh, needs um, 
a little bit more structured uh, environment, so we deploy it in a VM. It can be either on your laptop or on a server somewhere, and still run uh, just the orchestration container. The difference between this and uh, the local scenario is that uh, this VM is an exact copy of the add node you left uh, on a physical port. From there, we can uh, slightly scale it up uh, to the single scenario. In this, we have the orchestrator, we have ONOS, um, and we are working to have uh, Kubernetes in there to test some of the, the functionality. We have also OpenStack in there, so you have a virtualized full pod that you can deploy on a single server uh, to do your, uh, your validation on the DNF. If someone has seen uh, the demo we were doing on, uh, on Ford at the Sense Fair, uh, we were demonstrating the subscriber uh, connectivity for our Ford using exactly that scenario. Uh, and finally, we have the most important one. Uh, it's called Ford and it's nothing but uh, a physical pod. It's completely configurable, so uh, whatever your configuration is, either if you have uh, one compute node, 10, 20, 100, uh, we can support you. We have a set of profile. Uh, Guru uh, introduced the concept uh, of e -corp, r -corp, and m -corp that are, uh, are shooting to provide different kind uh, of access, of access, and we have talks later that are going to cover them uh, very deeply. From the orchestrator perspective, uh, what does this mean? That uh, we have a different set of services that we should run. Um, we have a base uh, profile that we call front-end that is just the orchestrator plane with no services at all. And then you can use a combination of the one that we provide or provide your own set of services to achieve different functionalities in the network. Uh, we have pod configs that are a combination of the core profile and the scenario. For example, uh, we can deploy a really minimal uh, development environment, just the orchestrator on our computer, or we want to try out the hardcore services without the backend to verify that the, uh, that the data model works and the synchronizer are different or of with what we have in mind. Or we can run and core on a single server to have a, a smaller validation of what we are doing. Uh, how does a physical core pod uh, looks like from the software perspective? Uh, we have a node that we deploy Docker OpenStack to Onosys to manage the overlay and the underlay network, XOS, all the UIs and all the service synchronizer we need. And we have a set of an arbitrary number of compute nodes in which we deploy the DNF in, form, in a form of uh, uh, VM or a Docker container, it doesn't really matter. Do we need all of this to do our daily job? I would say no. For sure we don't need the compute nodes to do our testing. Most of the time, uh, since we abstract them out, uh, we don't need OpenStack, we don't need on, and we don't need the synchronizer, because as long as you provide us um, your Ansible instruction to talk with your DNF, you can work on that without a synchronizer and we provide the glue between the data model and your Ansible templates. So we can shutting down our environment and make it easier to manage, uh, easier to, to move around. We can deploy with the local or the mock configuration uh, on our laptop. The source code uh, is shared so we can just make changes, rebuild the container, and see what the outcome is. Uh, what are the uses of this scenario? Uh, it's really important for platform developers. We can work on the PI, on the UI, we can refine the data model, and we can work on all the, the tool chain and the shared libraries we provide uh, inside XOS. Uh, it's useful also for a service developer. They can check their configuration, uh, they can validate their data model, and they can do some, uh, some basic testing on their functions. But at a certain point, 
uh, we need to really deploy somewhere uh, our VNS and check that it works end to end. That's where Coordinate Box um, came into play. This is what we call the single scenario. Uh, so we have a development machine that is actually a copy of the same one you are using to deploy a physical, uh, a physical pod. Uh, we can make or pull changes in that, that machine, rebuild the container images, publish this image on a Docker registry that is shared between our development machine and the Adenom, and we can push uh, those images and redeploy them. Uh, when is this used? Uh, when we want to build a synchronizer, when we want to do integration tests between all the services that we have and we want to uh, validate end-to-end -end connectivity. Uh, now let's talk a little bit uh, about Acorn. Uh, the three profiles uh, we are really focusing on are uh, residential cord, mobile cord, and enterprise cord. These are um, vertical and really focused effort um, to enable different kind uh, of access equipment. Acorn uh, is slightly different. Um, sometimes it's confusing that uh, the name is really similar, but this is an horizontal effort to cover uh, all the three scenarios and the platform. What is it for? Uh, once we have our pod uh, deployed, we need to control it. Uh, agility is good, but we need uh, a monitoring system. Uh, we need to check everything we added a lot of new concepts, so uh, we need to monitor the infrastructure, the compute nodes, storage, the network, uh, the devices. And on top of that, we need to put some intelligence uh, to protect ourselves, and we need to uh, understand uh, what is happening in our data and how to optimize that. So, how does it work? We have our pod uh, deployed. Uh, we collect data from every component that we have deployed uh, in the system. Uh, we publish them uh, into an, uh, a notification bus. We do some analysis on them, and you can provide it here your application to react to the changes uh, in your system as better uh, as you decide to. This application can take decision, push them down to the orchestrator, and the orchestrator will apply them uh, to the pod. Uh, what's a really high-level uh, view of it? Uh, in all the places of, of our deployment, uh, we are basically wiretapping ports, uh, CPUs, memory, storage. We are getting information from uh, from there, we are passing them up um, into, into a data storage and into a message bus. Uh, this data gets pushed in real time um, to the top level where the application are running, and when the decisions are taken, uh, they get pushed down to orchestrator that goes every provision, uh, our deployment as needed. Uh, if you want more information on this, uh, I suggest you to go on the wiki or uh, join Slack. The team is really welcoming and is looking for a collaboration on that side. You can find them uh, on the Acorp channel. Let's talk, let me spend two minutes uh, about the community. For me, it's amazing to be uh, here at the Honest Build uh, to see all this interest uh, about this project. Uh, I hope you can have the same interest uh, about Corb, and I hope that I gave you uh, an idea of uh, the possibility that Corb has and the complexity that Corb has. At the moment, uh, we are doing our best, but we are around 10 developers trying to realize this, so we may need to, some help from you. So please, guys, go uh, join a brigade. These are some of the more active ones, but there are a bunch. If you 
uh, have some other use cases, just come talk to us if you have ideas, whatever. Uh, you can find more information about the community uh, on the cord uh, on the cord. <laughs> And last but not least, I want to remember you again that in one month and a half we are going to have the court build uh, in San Jose, California. Uh, I hope the most of you can, uh, can join there. And that's it. So thanks for coming. If you have any questions, just catch me around or you can find me at this email address or that handle basically everywhere else. Thanks again. Thanks, Teo, for that uh, great technical overview and introduction to a lot of the, the core components and systems. Uh, we probably have time for, for one or two burning questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to, to step up to the mic. Oh, okay, well, let's uh, thank Teo again. Thanks. So uh, just as a reminder, I mean, I think uh, looking through the slides and, and watching uh, watching the talk, uh, it's easy to become overwhelmed, uh, especially you know given the, the, the large number of components and, and sort of rapid pace of development that's going on in court. But uh, these guys, uh, Teo and others, are, are on the mailing lists. Uh, they're on Slack. Uh, they're available. Um, and so if you find yourself uh, being overwhelmed or, or confused, unclear where to start, uh, there's some great resources uh, that you can catch either here before they leave or, or online. So, uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to invite uh, Charles Chen, uh, who's a, a member of the Open Networking Foundation, to talk about Trellis. Uh, so, Trellis is the white box, open source, SDN-based leaf uh, spine fabric uh, that's sort of the foundation for the, the data center fabric that, that Cord, all flavors of Cord use. Uh, Charles is a newly elected member of the ambassador steering team uh, for Cord. He's also a, an Onos and Cord ambassador. So, welcome, Charles. Thank you everyone. Thank you Brian for your introduction. Um, I'm Charles Chen from Open Networking Foundation and um, today I'm going to talk about Trellis. Uh, it's an open source white box SDN based leaf spine network fabric. So uh, here's my agenda. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the past which is the uh, existing basic features of Trellis. Um, just for those people who, um, who haven't uh, heard about this and then I will spend most of my time talking about uh, features we recently uh, implemented in, in the past year. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about our roadmap. Okay, so uh, what is Trellis? So as I mentioned, Trellis is an um, L2, L3 leaf spine data center network fabric. Uh, it is based on open source software, uh, white box hardware. It's SDN based solution, and of course it uses ONUS as its SDN controller. Okay, um, so in order to talk about Trellis, uh, I would like to show you this typical topology we, we use. So uh, as you can see, these four uh, blue boxes are uh, two by two leaf spine uh, hardware switches. Uh, we attach uh, two hosts to each of the leaf switch. Uh, we have some special devices, like this red one we call access device, that will further connect to your house or you know, to mobile subscribers. On the right hand side, we also have several uh, special hosts. Uh, from the top is the Quagga, which is our uh, software routing, uh, soft, uh, routing protocol. Um, it will talk to the upstream router, which is the, the second green box. Uh, and then uh, we also have this DHCP server uh, attached on the right hand side, which is the orange box. Um, and then with this uh, typical topology, I'm going to introduce uh, what's the basic uh, feature we provide in Trellis. So the, the very basic uh, feature is, uh, sorry, it's actually not IP before bridging, it should be L2 bridging. Um, so basically uh, we assume that um, in the same rack, which is the, like these two hosts on the left hand side, they're in the same subnet. So if they want to talk to each other, we provide uh, L2 bridging for these two uh, hosts. We also have uh, IPv4 unicast routing, 
that's used when you want to do an inter-rack communication, like these two purple hosts, when you want to talk uh, across the rack. Uh, so the source host will send the packet to the source leaf. And the source leaf would then hash uh, this packet through uh, multiple spies. Uh, this is done by uh, ECMP uh, hashing in order to do load balance and also provide more redundancy. And then on the destination side, the destination uh, leaf switch will just send a packet to the destination host. Okay, um, IPv4 multicast, it's uh, typically used for IPTV. feature is to use for, for the Quagga to peer with the upstream router in order for uh, our users to talk to the upstream, to the internet. Um, so that's, a, that's the basic features of the trellis fabric. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about uh, a few improvements we have done uh, in the past year. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with the, the first challenge we, we faced. Uh, it's, it's about the VLAN support. So uh, as you may know that um, uh, the trellis solution is right now based on the OFDPA uh, pipeline. The OFDPA pipeline requires an uh, internal VLAN assigned to, to every on-tag traffic. Um, therefore, we need to internally assign this VLAN ID for every on-tag traffic. And previously, uh, this is done by, um, we assign this internal VLAN by, uh, by looking at the subnet configuration. So it's only one VLAN, one subnet. And what's the problem of this? Um, the, the problem is, is that the first, first of all, um, it did not support uh, tag traffic, uh, which is actually um, highly required by a lot of use cases. Um, there's only, there was only one uh, exception, which is the cross-connect I mentioned. And, and second is that it, it did not support multiple subnet on the same physical port, which is also another very common use case. Um, so, uh, this is the uh, their configuration it looked like before. Uh, we only specify IP address on, on an interface. So in the new, configura in the new configuration, we add a more explicit uh, VLAN config in, in our configuration to support, for example, like access port. Uh, we have this uh, VLAN on tag configuration. This basically means that um, I expect the traffic to come in this port as on tag traffic. I will internally assign VLAN 10 to this uh, traffic. We also support trunk port uh, uh, with this VLAN tag uh, configuration. This basically means that um, I expect um, the packet coming into this port uh, are, are coming with the um, VLAN tag 20 or 30 or 40. And then the fabric will keep the VLAN untouched and then uh, you will just send it out. Um, but what if we want to have like a mixture of trunk port and, and we also want to accept on tag traffic? So we also implement the uh, trunk port with native VLAN. It's pretty similar to um, how you configure this VLAN in, in traditional networks. So uh, you can specify VLAN tag um, and then you can also have this VLAN native configuration. So basically if any on tag traffic come into this port, it will get assigned with VLAN 10 and then you'll also accept traffic with VLAN tag 20, 30, and 40. So uh, let's give an example, which, which is probably easier to understand this. So uh, this is a, a, a leaf switch. Uh, we can have uh, an on-tag host uh, attached to this leaf switch, and we can put on-tag 10 uh, configuration on leaf switch. Uh, so this basically means that uh, this on-tag host will send on-tag traffic. Uh, when you reach the switch, you internally tag with VLAN 10. Okay. Um, we can also have a tag host with a tag configuration, like the trunk port in the traditional network. Uh, we can have the trunk port configuration with native VLAN, um, and then we can attach a, 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 a tag um, host with VLAN 20. We can also attach more than one host uh, on, on the same port. Um, this is usually happen when you have multiple VLAN on the same physical port. Uh, we can have on tag traffic, uh, on tag host here. We can also have uh, another uh, VLAN tag host with a different VLAN ID. We can have another port with uh, tag 30. We can have uh, another on tag port. So uh, basically, this green one is a uh, misconfiguration. Just want to show you. Um, we cannot have uh, on tag host on tag port. It is also not possible to have a tag host on, on tag port. 
So uh, by looking at the color, you'll see that uh, the red ones are actually in the same uh, VLAN or broadcast domain. And the purple one are in the same uh, broadcast domain, and also the orange ones are in the same uh, broadcast domain. Okay. Um, so the second challenge I would like to talk about is the um, single point of failure problem. So uh, the, the deep spy topology already provides us uh, redundancies between leaves and spine, right? We have multiple paths we can choose to go from one leaf to another leaf. But we still have this problem. We only have one single top of rack switch, and what happens if the switch goes down, or, or the link from the host to the switch goes down? Then uh, this host will lose all the connectivity, and then there is no way to recover. Um, so in order to address this problem, uh, we, we recently introduced a feature called dual homing. Basically, um, we add a second set of top of rack switch, like this. So the second top of rack switch, the one on the left hand side, um, it connect, also connect to uh, both spine switch, and also there is a link from the, the, the new Tor switch to, to the host. And you can also see this actual link between these two, uh, we call it leaf pairs. I will talk about uh, the use of this uh, extra link between these leaf pairs uh, later. Okay, so um, in, in order to use this dual homing feature, uh, we need to configure uh, a lead spawning phase on the host. Uh, we recommend to use uh, balance XOR uh, with uh, transmit hash policy layer 2 plus 3. This is the, uh, the most efficient way we have right now. Uh, we also support wrong routing or you know, balance XOR with other hash policy, but these are less efficient. So we do not recommend, but we support it. So what happened when this dual home host want to talk to other hosts in the network? So it will send the traffic according to the, uh, the boundary interface and the transmit policy, you will, you will pick one. For example, if they pick the left hand one, and then uh, also this uh, leaf switch will hash uh, the traffic to uh, the two spies and then go to the destination leaf, and then the destination leaf will send it to a destination host. Um, it is also possible that the boundary interface choose the other one, right? Um, so in this case, it's a hash to uh, both spines and then, sorry, and then going down to uh, the destination host. This is about the forward path. And then for the reverse or backward path, uh, this single host on the left hand side will send the uh, reply. So uh, here's the special part. Uh, here, we actually not only hash to two spines, we also hash to four, uh, two uh, different target leaves. So we, are, we will actually have four options here. You can go to spine one and then leaf one, spine two, leaf one, spine whatever, I'm confused. <laughs> anyway, um, so you have four options to go to one of the leaf pair and then going down to your target host. So this basically provides uh, extra redundancy to your dual home host. So uh, when one of the um, leaf pair goes down or one of the link goes down, you can still have connectivity to this host. Now let's to, to, uh, take a look at the failure scenario. Um, so assume that the link on the left, left hand side goes down, right? And uh, according to the hashing policy, it is still possible that uh, the leaf switch on the left hand side trying to hash the traffic to the to the failure location. Uh, here's when the um, the link between leaf pair uh, um, come to use. Uh, we, we use this uh, link to the between the leaf pair to um, to redirect the traffic to another leaf pair and then further going down to the uh, target host. So uh, there is a note that um, the pair link is only used when uh, when local failure happens. When I say local, it means that it's a, a um, intra rack failure. If if the failure happened between leaf and spine, we will basically do uh, the entire rerouting, not entirely like partial rerouting, but it's just not not going to use this uh, pair link. So this pair link is only used for like to recover from local failure. Okay. Um, challenge three is also about a single point failure, but this time we want to talk about different component. This time we want to talk about the Quagga and upstream router. So as you can see in, uh, in the diagram, uh, it is also possible that the Quagga or the upstream router can fail, 
or the link connect to the Quagga upstream uh, router can fail. So in this case, uh, in a previous uh, implementation, we have no way to reach the internet. So in order to solve this problem, we uh, introduced this dual Quagga, dual router uh, uh, feature. So basically, we add uh, the, the, uh, another set of uh, upstream router in Quagga. Right? And, and as you can see, this is uh, also a, a pair uh, leaf switch. So uh, the first set of Quagga and, and upstream router, they peer with each other. And once Quagga receives uh, the route advertised from the upstream router, it would send the information to Honest. The second pair of Quagga and uh, upstream router also pair with each other and it also push the information to Honest. And then we have this logic in Honest to, to pick the, the proper route in order to go out to the internet. So, uh, when, when an internal host like this purple one want to go to the internet, you go to the leaf switch, um, hash to probably one of the spy and going out from uh, upstream one. It's also possible it, it get hashed to a second leaf switch and then going out from uh, upstream router two. Now, uh, the failure scenario. For example, if the router 2, uh, the option router 2 fail, in this case, so we will lose the connectivity, lose the BGP session between Quagga 2 and uh, option 2, and then it will uh, revoke the route from the Honest. The Honest will understand that um, there is only one, one available route right now, which is going through R1. So uh, it will also remove the flows that point to uh, the fa failure point. It will only go to the um, the available uh, next hub, which is R1. And we can even uh, have even more redundancy here. So uh, this is the, uh, you know, uh, the, the diagram I showed before. Uh, we have uh, Q1 uh, paired with R1, Q2 paired with R2. We can actually add uh, extra link, two extra links actually, um, between, uh, uh, you know, like this, like the cross then we can have a, an extra pair between Q2, R1, and then uh, Q1, R2. So in this case, uh, if one of the links fail, we don't have to reroute anything. Uh, we only reroute when two links uh, goes down. And this will provide even more redundancy. And by the way, it is also possible that option router 1 and option router 2 are actually advertising uh, different routes. And it's also possible, it's also supported in Honest. Okay, and uh, that's all about the improvement we've done in the past year. Now I'm going to talk about uh, new features. Uh, the first new feature I would, I would like to introduce is uh, L3 DSCP Relay. Uh, basically, before we uh, need to static, statically configure the IP address on the host, but right now we can actually use DSCP. When the host sends a DSCP request to the leaf switch, the leaf switch will capture that and pack it into Honest Controller. The OS controller will then send a packet out to the target switch, which where it, um, the DHCP server attaches to, and then you will send a packet out directly to the DHCP server. So, and also it's the same path uh, for the backward traffic. So, in, in this case, the host can actually obtain an IP address from from DHCP server. It is also possible that uh, we put a DHCP server even behind the action router. Um, for example, it can be anywhere in a cloud. Uh, because we use L3 DOCP relay, it's a, uh, after it pass on us, it will become an L3 unicast routing packet. So uh, as long as you can route that packet, we can deliver that to uh, DOCP server. Um, other uh, features um, are like, we also support uh, IPv6 bridging and routing. We also support BGPv6 peering. And we also support IPv6 multicast right now, and also DHCPv6 relay. Um, the reason I use different color for uh, the later two features is because uh, these two are actually contributed by the community members uh, from Nokia. Um, okay, and then I will also quickly talk about the roadmap, uh, the features we are going to implement recently um, so the first one is dynamic interface config. This is something we consider that as a uh, technical debt that has been there for quite a while. We want to address this problem and then enable the user to dynamically change the uh, interface config, to change the VLAN, to change the, uh, the subnet config 
configuration um, dynamically. Uh, the second thing we are also doing, and this is also with the help uh, of the community, is the IPv6 stateless uh, auto config. So we already support the CPv6. Now this is the uh, kind of the uh, remaining story we have for IPv6 support. We need to support this uh, auto configuration. Uh, we also want to support inman control. Uh, there is a use case where. Uh, the operator would like to put the leaf switch in a, in a field which is far away from the central office. In this case, it's pretty hard to have a dedicated uh, control, plan tra uh, control plan link. So we want to use link, uh, event control to control those uh, leaf switches uh, you know, on the remote side. Uh, we also want to support lag uh, link aggregation. This is also in a discussion. Um, uh, the other thing is pseudo wire. Um, we we um, so right now uh, we have a, a small limitation by the uh, hardware design, but we have a, a workaround, and we are going to implement that workaround. Um, and also, this is very important. ISSU. Uh, every operator care about this in service software upgrade. Um, we are also working with the uh, honest ISSU brigade um, uh, very closely to try to design and implement this feature. Um, the next one is, uh, you may have noticed already, uh, the only single point of failure right now is actually the access device. We have dual home server, we have dual home upstream router, we have dual, uh, we have more than one uh, spy switches. So the only single point of failure right now is actually the access device. So we are also going to dual home the access device in the future. And of course there are more, it's just, not prioritized, but we have a lot of things to do. Okay, um, that's basically my talk. Uh, I would encourage you to attend Core View 2017 uh, to learn more about Trellis. I am going to give a hands-on tutorial in Core Build. Um, so basically, there will be a step-by-step uh, -step introduction about how to configure this, uh, how to use it, and how to troubleshoot this. Um, so uh, it's going to happen in November in uh, San Jose, California, and here's the uh, link to the website. So thank you. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the following companies who've been working very closely with us in the past years, um, and they've also contributed a lot of uh, work uh, in Trellis. And of course, there are definitely more uh, which are not listed. Okay. So that's all about my talk. I'm open for a question right now. Thank you. So thanks, Charles. Uh, any any questions from the audience? Uh, uh, okay. Go yes. on. Previously in the cord uh, fabric, uh, we were using segment routing uh, protocol, right? Now it's like kind of totally not being used, or uh, uh, what is this scenario? So um, you're right, we are using segment routing, and we are still using segment routing, but right now, um, um, so the way we use segment routing is that, well, unfortunately I don't have my slides anymore, but uh, basically, uh, Yes, we still use some routing right now, um, but we modified that a little bit. So actually, currently, it's not a, a, a very general second routing protocol. It's only limited to to our use case, which is a leaf side fabric. <coughs> so um, actually, in order to reduce the confusion here, we actually plan to rename that same routing app to fabric control in the future. But anyway, it's still a same routing based uh, control. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? So uh, I have a question for you, Charles. Sure. Um, so maybe you could uh, explain how um, you work on different types of, of switches with different types types of pipelines. How how is that abstraction handled? Do you have to handle that in the application, or, or how do you do that? Well, um, the fact is that there is no different kind of pipeline. We only have one, which is OFDPA right now. But we do have different switches from different vendors. 
and their software version, hardware version are, are slightly different. So we have uh, we spent a lot of time just trying to verify uh, this, the hardware switch behavior and also the software on the, uh, the switch. So we have this uh, a tool called OF test, which is uh, um, it can basically test the pipeline behavior to make sure uh, the software uh, on the, uh, on a switch uh, is actually working. Uh, properly, which means working according to the spec, because you know, for, for for most of the time it actually doesn't. And then once we verify that, then we we can further uh, conduct more tests on on you know by connecting the hardware switches to to the real uh, honest controller, and in, in order to verify this end-to-end -end traffic. Yes. Thanks. Please. So, you know, the white boxes, right? So what's the device management? Uh, is that the, the, as the functionality of the device management, such as the <coughs> alarms of the switch or whatever, uh, is that covered in this project or is somewhere else is covering that project? Well, unfortunately it's not covered here right now, but um, in the future we may have um, it's probably in a, in a roadmap, but uh, it's not prioritized yet. So currently, we don't have any uh, mechanism like that. Okay, because I think that's a difference between the Volta and then this one, right? So Volta, exactly. we have the OOT devices. Yeah. So, um, so some uh, other features I haven't listed in my uh, roadmap is actually like you know device management and also like telemetry and other stuff. Those are the features that uh, operators really do care about, yeah. but those are just not, not prioritized yet, but it's already in the list. The list has over 50 items right now. Only 50? <laughs> <laughs> over 50. Okay. Good. But are you expecting the, the, the white box vendor to provide that device manager features, or it will be more common managing the uh, model? Well, I, I think in order to implement this, uh, we definitely need to uh, work with the, the switch vendor because, uh, you know, in, in some cases, just not not only on our side, it's also the, the switch need to support that, right? For example, uh, the in-band control, it's also, uh, we also need the uh, support from the uh, chip vendor like Broadcom and also the switch vendor like Acton. So we work very closely with them uh, in order to deliver the, these, these kind of features. Well, that definitely have some common um, uh, requirement between your project and then the boat tag also. So yeah, I think so. That's good. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. If someone has a question for us. Okay, I speak too fast. <laughs> Uh, so I guess this brings the, for, the first part of the Court Basics track to a close. Uh, let's thank Charles again for his talk. Thank you. So uh, we'll have about 18 minutes uh, for coffee. Uh, so uh, the coffee will just be served at the, the top of the stairs. Uh, and then at, at 3 o'clock, please come back to the, the auditorium and we'll have uh, two more talks uh, this afternoon.
God is great.
<laughs> no, it's, we're going to total have an hour and a half. That's basically all the talks you get. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's more flexible. Okay. <laughs> that is a that drawing is about right. It's just that try to keep people stay as long as they can. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so we're, we're here in the Chord Basics track, uh, and we've got uh, three 20-minute presentations coming up. We're going to do Enterprise Chord, uh, Mobile Chord, and then uh, Residential Chord, in that order. Uh, so our first speaker, without further ado, is Andrea Campanella. He's a, a member of the technical staff at Open Networking Foundation. Uh, he's also the Ambassador-in-Chief uh, for Onos and Chord Project. So welcome, Andrea. Thanks, Brian, for introducing me. And uh, I'm going to be brief because probably you're tired. I'm a little bit tired too. But <laughs> I want to introduce you to, to eCord, so the enterprise flavor of uh, the Chord platform, and a project that we call SDN One Done Right. Uh, as Brian said, I'm Andrea Campanella. And uh, just let me give you a little bit of motivation of why we do eCord. Uh, just we want to go one step further 
Then we will introduce the eco architecture and services, both on the global and local sites. And then also I want to talk about uh, the roadmap, some partners and some results that we achieved. So this, the eco project uh, la um, was lately showcased at ONS 2017 with a lot of partner organizations, China Unicom, uh, obviously the Open Networking Foundation, Nokia, Microsemi, and since then also China Mobile joined and is planning to deploy eCord, which is a great uh, thing in a, for our uh, project. So, you've already seen this, the, probably the right side of this picture, which is the general cord architecture. This is the fabric, plus ONOS and XOS. But what does eCord add to this? Basically, we add virtual networks as a service, which brings in a self-serving portal, zero-touch provisioning for these networks and the devices comprised uh, of these virtual networks, uh, simple elements on premises, all the intelligence stays in the um, central office, and these virtual networks combine broadband and SLAs connections. Then we integrate analytics in order to observe, control, and adapt, both from the A chord, using A chord, but also introducing some of our own, as we can see later. We will use programmable probes and also activate on demand monitoring. Then we add some custom services for enterprises, special security, application policy control, while acceleration, etc. But the whole point to that I want also to make here is that this is not a completely new element, but it's based on the open core platform, which is usable by different flavors of core. It's not just residential core, but is now based, uh, eCord is now based on that, and there are multiple um, new services. So, network service as a service, you can see the topology, we use kind of a network topology, very similar to ONOS, and uh, this is where you can make the virtual networks. This is where you decide where, which two of your uh, company um, central offices connect to each other. The integrated analytics I was talking about, this is the eCord XOS view that shows, for example, delay and jitter based upon OAM and CFM standard over layer 2 monitoring. And this is how you set up the custom services for enterprises. So, why do we say SDN done right, uh, SD-WAN done right? Basically because, as you know, today, uh, in wide, uh, software defined wide area network, you want to go from the enterprise HQ to another enterprise HQ or to the public cloud through mobile internet or MPLS technology to another branch office. And uh, today there is automated monitoring, multiple network connections, and business routes for applications to go to the public cloud, and also branch to branch for very fast operations between the ent same enterprise. But what do we add? If you, uh, you use eCord, basically you place a big or small or very tiny cord pod at every site that your enterprise has, or even um, further back and just put the CPE that we provide in your uh, enterprise branch. And this enables you to have the same thing that SD-WAN has, so automated monitoring, business rules for applications, and branch-to-branch -branch traffic optimization. But we, and we do this through some policies at the start of the traffic, but also we add services because we use the core platform, and so XOS and the fabric. So we, uh, we build upon community, uh, community hardware, um, and com uh, open source uh, software platform and on programmable CPEs, which is a very fundamental piece for us. And at the other core site, you have intelligent edge for low latency managed services. Since we control both edges, we are able to um, out, um, make this much more faster than it would used to be 
and also put services uh, that understand each other because we control exactly what's going on on the network. So how does this work? We have what we call a global view and a local view. The global view is metro orchestration. It what does end-to-end uh, -end resource identification, uh, computation of the path, and uh, um, understands what can be provided through, to a customer through this uh, network. And basically, to this element, we submit a layer X VPN request. And for now, we implemented layer 2 VPN. And so, what uh, this happens, what this, when you submit a layer, let's say, 2 VPN request, the Metro Orchestration Onus, which is a core pod uh, with, uh, sorry, the Metro Orchestration pod, with the, which is a pod with XOS and Onus, which is no fabric, but it has some services on top of it, understands this request and breaks it down into multiple requests that need to be made at each, each pod. And also, very important, not only to the pod, but also to the transport network in the middle. And since we have multiple forwarding constructs, for example, that go down to all of these elements, we're able to make uh, the services end-to-end -end and much faster. So every site gets a configuration uh, for this layer X VPN, but, and uh, the transport network gets some connectivity policy. So, uh, this global ONUS actually accesses and gives instructions to both the ONUS that controls the fabric of cord and the ONUS that controls the access, so access devices, in our case, the CPEs. And in our case, we also manage the transport network through ONUS, but you can have this as uh, uh, MPLS-based network or simple cross-connect uh, or, or, or simple like a single switch transport network. Uh, and we demonstrated the uh, eCord with, uh, as I said, an optical transport network through uh, the disaggregated Rodom project uh, and um, that handles requests from the top to provide end-to-end -end connectivity through optical paths. But we also uh, have, you can also have other options uh, like uh, MPLS for this. You, it doesn't have to be SDN uh, controlled through ONUS. Obviously, if it's SDN controlled through ONUS, we can do further optimization. So, I talked about how the global service chain works, meaning you submit a layer, layer X VPN and it gets break down into multiple configuration for each component of your network, so the different cord sites and also the transport network. But now let's focus a little bit on how the local cord sites enable enterprise services. So we have an enterprise subscriber which is connected to the uh, CPE, which can be virtual or also physical. We have demonstrated this with both virtual and physical CPEs. In the case of physical CPEs, we do tagging of the traffic, for example. Then we have the VEE that uh, enables us to do um, Ethernet Edge services. Then we split the traffic into two paths, what we call the fast path, which goes to the other enterprise branch and the enterprise network. And that goes to the pseudo wire Charles was talking to you about before. So this is basically a bypass of the fabric. And then we go, the other path is through the VEG, which is something very similar to the VSG, which John will talk about later, so I'll let him uh, explain that in detail. And then through the V router to the, to the internet. This is what we call the slow path, because it doesn't go to another enterprise branch. And as you see, on premises, there's just a CPE, the central office with the leaf spine fabric and white box internet switches and the compute server has the, the, these services and then the metro networks deal with, uh, uh, every, uh, with going to the other uh, elements and um, where you want to go with your traffic. 
So in the CPE, we do server classification, we do programmable on demand OAM, as I said before, for monitoring. Uh, Sometimes the CPE can be offloaded to hardware. Um, on the VEG, the HTTP fold, NAT, uh, we NAT for the internet traffic, and we plan to extend this with the firewall, some encryption. On the VEE, we do the QoS, metering and queuing, with different shape, as I said, between the public that goes to VEG and the private traffic that goes to the SUSO wire. And um, the VEE is also the responsible for registering the local cord pod to the global cord pod. Because I said that is zero touch provisioning, and this is a key component in our architecture. So the, pod, the, lo the global view gets generated uh, from, the from the local uh, cord pods that expose themselves as kind of a big switches to the uh, global uh, view that we provide in the global XOS. Then the pseudo wire basically connects the network to network interface to, um, sorry, connects the Ethernet edge to the network, uh, to network interface or the Ethernet edge to the VEG and the network to network interface. Then it also applies VLAN tagging and it basically provides us a pass through to the fabric. So what did we show through eCore? This was successfully demonstrated at major events. We showed this at ONS multiple times. Uh, we showed this uh, especially concentrating on the disaggregated load of use case at the WebC. And the result is that we support carry internet service with strong SLAs. And as I said, we have a growing community which I encourage you to be part of. If your company, you as a service provider, anybody is interested in joining eCord and providing access for enterprises, please come and join China Mobile, China Unicom Entity, and also Telecom Italia as service provider, and Nokia, Argela, and Microsemi as vendors. For example, Microsemi is the one providing our CPEs. Um, as I said, China Unicom is committed to do field trial and deploy eCord, and uh, China Mobile is actually also committed uh, next release of Cord, as was multiple times said, is about to be uh, out this September. It's called Shared Illusion, and I encourage you to go to the Cord website. <coughs> Future roadmap: We have um, com to complete the Cord Fabric integration with the VNF support, and this is because, as Charles uh, hinted before, we're hitting some small problems with the hardware in the fabric that we will address very soon. It it's, it's in progress. Um, we want to, com uh, to complete also uh, other type of uh, transport domain integration. As I said, now we have an optical uh, transport network, but uh, we, we plan to do also MPLS, for example. Um, let the layer 2 monitoring OEM and CFM, this is something that we demonstrated at ONS, and we are in the process of hardening. Um, Something that we really look forward to is the ONAP collaboration and integration as the global orchestrator. Now we have XOS and as a global orchestrator, but a lot of service providers are asking us to go and have a look at what ONAP does and see if we can integrate that instead of uh, XOS. Uh, since we use the LSO Presto API to communicate between the cent uh, central office local and the global, uh, XOS, uh, plan to auto generate that API through the Yang tools, um, expand layer, um, layer to layer 3 VPN, for example. We also want to have on demand provisioning of services. Right now, the service chain that you have seen on the local node is kind of fixed. But maybe in the future, for each central office, and this is what we aim to do we could activate different service chains depending on the need of the enterprise subscriber. Maybe on a smaller central office, you just need a few subsets of the bigger chain in a bigger central office, which serves more, uh, more uh, customers and enterprises. You want a longer service chain. So this is what on-demand VNF provisioning is. And we also plan to offload some of the VNFs to CPE. So some further reading. Core you've seen, 
any tutorial you want on the wiki. eCord is also part of the OpenCord code base that you can download on GitHub. And uh, I encourage you to send me or Mark, which is the leader of the project, uh, an email. Shoot us an email with the thoughts, ideas, uh, considerations, uh, want to partner. Well, we're open to that. We're just a few developers and we would very much like collaboration and uh, driving effort from service providers and vendors. So that's all I got. I uh, hope it was interesting for you and it cleared a little bit about uh, the eCord picture. Uh, any questions? I know I introduced a lot of concepts in these, well, 16 minutes, but uh, if anybody has any thoughts, any considerations, I'm open to, to listen to them. If not, as I said, they can, they can come all, all online as email or a message or whatever you prefer. Also, we're present on Slack, the code Slack, so you can contact also there. Any questions? Okay, great, let's thank Andrea. Thanks everybody. So next up we have uh, Oz Sonne, uh, Sonai, sorry, um, from ONF. Uh, he's the MCOR chief architect, uh, as well as a TST member for the core project. So, welcome Oz. about uh, how we are using CORD and within that ONOS uh, to uh, enable uh, the 5G Edge Cloud. Um, so let me first uh, make a case of why MCORD is, is really important. Um, let's look at the business proposition first. So as far as the mobile service providers go, um, there has been a transition in early 2000s. They moved from uh, a voice dominant service provisioning uh, to a mobile broadband dominant service provisioning. And that, coupled with our exponentially increasing hunger for uh, consuming data, um, caused a gap between the revenues and, uh, and the traffic. Uh, more spe most specifically, um, just between 2017 and 2022, we still expect an eight-fold increase in mobile traffic data. Um, and this is going to be mainly due to video. And uh, to satisfy this, uh, service providers will need to continuously upgrade um, their infrastructure uh, and their platforms. Uh, that means there's going to be continuous increase in CapEx and OpEx. But unfortunately, uh, this uh, is going to uh, not necessarily generate as much increase in their revenues. Uh, because as end users, we are actually using the service provider's infrastructure to reach OTTs, cloud providers, media companies, and spend our money on them and not necessarily the service providers. And even more importantly, uh, the money that we spend for these OTTs and service providers, they don't necessarily share the brunt of the service provider's necessity to upgrade their infrastructure. So this means actually for mobile service providers, a transformation is imminent. Uh, and this needs to happen in two, uh, in two parallel paths. One, they need to transform their networks so that their CapEx and OpEx uh, are lower. And 
they can more rapidly, uh, they, they need a platform where they can more rapidly innovate and deploy new services. And the second is they need to position themselves significantly more deeply in the digital services platforms. So, the transformation of the network comes with cord. Uh, you've heard from Guru and uh, all of my colleagues at ONF uh, up until now how CORD is really uh, trying to um, enable this transformation for the service providers. And uh, in the case of mobility, uh, this uh, digital services ecosystem really necessitates the use for a dynamically controllable, configurable mobile network where we can do end-to-end -end network slicing in a very programmatic manner. And associated with each slices, we need the capability to dynamically create, edit, or terminate service chains. And Onos plays a significant or primary part in both aspects. Onos is a fundamental enabler for CORD, and in the case of MCORD, we actually use Onos for controlling our slicing and controlling our service chain. So let's talk about MCORD. So effectively, MCORD is the CORD platform for um, cellular networks. So it is built on the pillars of open source, disaggregation, uh, both for the core and the RAN, uh, virtualization, again, for both sides of, of the network, cloudification, and uh, programmability. And um, these pillars form what we call um, our edge, mobile edge cloud. So disaggregation in AMCORD is really, really important. Um, this is important not only in lowering the capex and opex, but it is also important in enabling new potential services. And when we talk about disaggregation, we're not necessarily just talking about disaggregating the central office components of the mobile network, but also the base stations themselves. So, the disaggregation of the RAN has already started in the form of Cloud RAN. Uh, you probably have heard of it. But in, within MCORD, we take that one step further. Um, so the first part was the disaggregation of the RAN into a distributed unit and a cloud unit. And that cloud unit, that component, uh, would be then virtualized and put in a cloud, an edge cloud. Uh, which is what CORD is. But that cloud unit, um, we actually disaggregate that into two again, into user plane and control plane, and realize the control plane of the cloud unit as an almost application. On the core, we disaggregate all of the EPC components. We follow the COPS compliancy to completely disaggregate the user and control plane of the 4G. And we realize all of the disaggregated components in a virtualized way within CORD. And we also plug in an ONOS application to enable policy-driven and uh, billing and charging capable uh, value-added services. So the disaggregated component within CORD looks something like this. Uh, and this is color-coded, by the way. So from the base station end, as you can see, uh, the Cloud RAN has been implemented, but within the Cloud RAN, we also have further disaggregation into user and control planes. And the control plane here uh, is realized as an ONOS application, you see as XRAN. But another thing that we do, and this is probably the world's first, uh, we 
enable cord to control the virtualization of the wireless resources so that we can do slicing dynamically programmable slicing of the RAM and that is handled by the ONO Center and slicing application there and uh, as far as the core EPC components are concerned we virtualize all of it so that a service provider can programmatically choose to instantiate certain components or all of it if they want to at the edge where, while keeping certain others at the core and the edge cloud also becomes a host for uh, multi-access edge uh, computing services and uh, we also have the core head node uh, control. So the thing to pay attention here is within Mcourt, the role of Onos is not just to control the fabric and the VTM at the edge cloud, but a fundamental aspect of Onos is its control of the RAM. And this is really, really important, especially when you consider the fact that about 75% of the cost of a service provider is the RAM. So here, another thing to pay attention is within CORD, we have the CORD control plane, right? Uh, that control plane is the communication between the CORD pod and ONOS, XOS, and OpenStack. But when you realize on this CORD platform, um, LTE or 5G for that matter, that actually comes with its own user and control plane. So you have a 3GPP control plane and a 3GPP user plane. So effectively, the architecture has two orthogonal control planes. One uh, is the 3GPP control plane, which is responsible for handling mobility, billing and charging and session management. And another control plane, which is the cord control plane, which allows the service providers value-added policy-driven or subscription-driven uh, new innovative services. So in that sense, uh, the ONOS within MCORT um, on top of segment routing and VTN uh, so far has three MCORT specific applications, two of which are for controlling the RAM. So on the RAN side, we have XRAN, and I will go into details of that. And we also have the end-to-end -end network slicing, which includes the slicing of the RAN, uh, the wireless resources. And we also have, in a CUPS compliant serving and packet gateway, user plane control plane separation, an ONOS application that sits in between which gives the service provider a network state on which they can populate their services. And the associated northbound and southbound uh, interfaces uh, have also been implemented uh, with an MCORT. So uh, for XRAN, we have an XRAN specific northbound and an XRAN specific southbound. Uh, for uh, the end-to-end -end slicing application, we have a program southbound and a program northbound. And for the SP gateway, we have the three GPP described SXA and SXB interfaces, both on the north and southbound. So now that we've uh, started talking about using ONOS to control the base stations, the RAN, um, and that brings immediately to mind, okay, we need a new network state description for the wireless link. Because the wireless link inherently is very, very different than any of the wi its wired components. So when you think of a wireless link, you have two types of nodes. You have the user equipment and you have the base station. And between them, you have links and these are wireless links and 
since we have slicing, uh, you have also slices. Um, so all of these components uh, form actually collectively the wireless network state. And for each component, we define a number of attributes. For example, for the base station node, uh, we have uh, the average throughput, the per user throughput, the maximum delay, and the number of users that are connected, uh, the number of uh, users that are uh, to be handed over, uh, etc. And the capabilities of the base station itself, how many antennas it has, what frequency band it, it, it is operational on, um, so on and so forth. So that forms uh, the wireless uh, network state. And Onos now has uh, that uh, embedded in it. And uh, using the northbound APIs, it abstracts that uh, to the applications. So the first application uh, to talk about is XRAN. So those of you who don't know, XRAN is um, a, uh, another open source consortium. Um, so um, in February at MWC Barcelona, uh, ONF and XRAN decided to work uh, very, very closely uh, to have an end-to-end -end solution. So the idea for XRAN is to uh, develop open source APIs uh, between um, the control components of the base station that have uh, less delay, uh, less constraint delay requirements. Examples, handovers, session management, and uh, uh, the specifics of uh, resource block division between multiple base stations, etc. So, uh, traditionally, in, uh, in all of 3GPP-based base stations, the base station control components reside scattered across the protocol stack, uh, which is partially realized in software. Um, so part of XRAN is to identify the components that are less delay, uh, uh, that have more relaxed delay, delay uh, constraints, and decouple them from, from the stack and realize them as part of an OS application. So we call that the central unit control plane uh, high. Uh, high means uh, there's a high tolerance to delay. So we realize this as an ONOS application, um, and that ONOS application has a corresponding agent uh, inside an XRAN compliant base station. That agent uh, directly controls certain eNodeB applications. These applications are the intercell radio resource management, resource block control, um, connection, uh, the uh, admission control, um, and uh, handovers, etc. Um, so uh, the XRAN application has also a north, uh, two specific northbound uh, interfaces. One interface actually allows that application to have specific RAN-based applications itself, like a handoff management application, but also another northbound interface that interfaces with something like XOS, or potentially directly with uh, on app, um, so that policies can be pushed down. Okay, the second application allows us to do RAN slicing as well as uh, core network slicing. So, in the case of RAN slicing, uh, the most important thing that we have achieved is the virtualization of the wireless resources. So once the wireless resources have been virtualized, uh, then uh, the RAN slicing ONOS application actually pushes down uh, slice-specific policies. And these policies uh, correspond to the amount of wireless resources that a specific slice uh, actually gets, and the corresponding RAN side control functionalities that uh, the base station needs to locally instantiate. 
Um, and uh, the ONOS application in real time can instantiate, edit, or terminate a RAN slice. Um, and the same application also does core network slicing. Um, so for that, following the 3GPP vision, uh, we see the base station as an anchor. Um, so the base station actually uh, is controlled by the ONOS program application, and uh, that application basically instructs the base station which flow to forward uh, to which EPC uh, realization within, within core. And this again can be dynamically altered in real time. So just like XRAN, the program application also has a corresponding agent at the base station, which uh, upon receiving the commands from uh, ONOS, um, executes that locally. And uh, the corresponding XOS interface for end-to-end uh, -end slicing looks something like this. So in this example, we see three base stations connected to um, our M cord, and as you can see, the middle base station has two RAN slices, and each RAN slice has been stitched to um, the same PC, whereas uh, the lower uh, E node B has two RAN slices, but each slice goes to another PC. So the stitching of a RAN slice to a core network slice is also programmable uh, and uh, it is done also by the ONOS application. Um, the last AMCORD uh, ONOS application I want to talk about is the application that resides in the core network, which is the SB gateway. Um, and this resides between the SP Gateway control and user planes. By the way, um, this whole uh, EPC um, is the official um, ONF M cord open source EPC. Um, so um, maybe I can uh, very quickly mention that uh, by the end of next month, we are going to have our first official M cord release. And that Accord release will come with open source EPC. And part of that EPC is an SDN application. And that, uh, this uh, application actually, as you can see, sits in between the user plane and the control plane of all of the flows within, uh, within LTE. Which means the network state here is each of the, for each of the flows, the flow type the number of bits that have been transmitted and uh, the, uh, the application that that flow belongs to, the user it belongs to. So uh, imagine a network state like that and specific northbound applications for, uh, for different billing and charging uh, components associated with it. Um, so, in a nutshell, this is uh, where we are with an M-Court. Um, and just last week, uh, there was uh, the first Mobile World Congress Americas in San Francisco, where we had a booth. And we showcased actually five different demos. Uh, and one was the x integration. Uh, another one was the open source EPC, where we actually augmented that demo with uh, a DPDK-based OBS uh, with an M-Cord to speed up the user plane. Um, and uh, we also showcased a diversification of the hardware that is available for constructing M-Cord, both on the fabric side, on the server side, as well as on the eNode B side. And another thing that we have showcased was the slicing, uh, where uh, we augmented that with link aggregation with Wi-Fi, uh, where the Wi-Fi becomes sliceable as well using the same ONOS application. And last but not least, one of the demos was uh, the marriage of R cord with M cord, um, so that the CPE at the home uh, can, uh, can do load balancing between these two uh, access technologies. Thank you.
Thanks, Oz. So we probably have time for one question, if there's any, any burning question uh, for Oz. Oh, all right. Thank, thanks again, Oz. So our next speaker is Jonathan Hart from the Open Networking Foundation. Uh, Jono is a member of the technical staff. Uh, he's also a member of the ONOS TST, and he'll be here talking today about Harport. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, so my name is Jonathan Hart, and uh, we're going to look at um, how we bring the, the principles of cord to the residential fixed line uh, broadband access, um, including looking at, looking at the different services that we have as part of uh, our cord to do this. Um, so we've heard a lot today about how cord is all about disaggregation, um, and our cord is certainly no different. Um, so this diagram is showing um, what, what the legacy residential broadband access architecture looks like. Um, if, we, if we look at the left-hand side of the diagram in the, re in the user's residence, uh, we can see they have a CVE device, a customer premises equipment. Um, and this is the, the wireless router that all of us have in our homes that is giving us uh, Wi-Fi access, doing DHCP, DNS, all those kind of functions. Um, in our code, we focus a lot on uh, this access technology called PON, uh, Passive Optical Networking, which is a fiber to the home uh, access technology. Um, and PON uses these devices called ONU and OLT uh, on either side of the, of the fiber link. Um, so in the residential, uh, in the residence, we have the, the ONU device, and then from there, there's a, a fiber link which goes up to the central office, um, and is terminated by this, by this device called an OLT, the optical line termination device. Um, from, yeah, and, and the OLT will terminate connections from multiple different subscribers. Um, from there, we, we go through to some more Ethernet aggregation, and then the traffic will end up at a device called a BNG, a broadband network gateway, uh, which is doing um, uh, routing and other, other functions like QoS on a per subscriber basis. Um, and then from there, the traffic will be in the central office and head out to the backbone network. Um, and obviously, in, in a legacy world, uh, these these are uh, sort of closed proprietary devices, which are combined hardware and they also a lot of different control software. Um, and you know, the goal of Cord is to try and, and change that to bring the functions out of the hardware and to put into the software, so we get the the uh, agility and the ability to change things that, that we want. Um, so let's see how we how this uh, works in our code. Um, so firstly. Um, uh, we have this, this function that we call the VSG, the Virtual Subscriber Gateway. Um, and, and the idea of the VSG is that we want to be, uh, given that we have compute resources so close to the, to the end user, we can now um, do some of the processing that we want to do on a per subscriber basis uh, on those compute resources in the central office, rather than having to do it in the CPU device, uh, which sits in the home. Um, so we can bring some of the functions that usually reside in the CPE and do them um, in the uh, central office. And an example of that is things like parental controls, right? Most of our um, uh, Wi-Fi routers have parental control facilities, um, but we can pull those out and do them in the central office. And this allows the service provider to be able to, to uh, bring more services uh, more quickly to uh, the residences. Uh, yeah, and secondly, um, uh, we can, we can like I say, the OLT devices uh, in the legacy world are um, proprietary closed, and they also contain a whole lot of uh, control software. Um, and so the idea in core is we want to lift that control software out of the OLT. So we still need the specialized hardware, because we still need to be able to do the, um, uh, the fiber uh, uh, functions. Um, but we can pull out the control software, and, and we can run it um, on the, the other hardware that we have. And then finally, we can bring out some of the functions of the, of the BNG. So for example, we will bring out the routing functions um, and run them as a service that we call the vRouter. Um, and then we can also, uh, because we, we, we have a choice about how we can uh, segregate things, so we can, we can move, uh, we don't have to just uh, pull the, VN, the BNG functions out into a vBNG, we can, we can sprinkle them across the other services that we have. So for example, some of the functionality will 
uh, go to the VSG, and some of them will go to the VLT as well. And then finally, uh, now that we've pulled all our functions out of the BNG, we don't actually even need a separate device for the BNG. We already have a switching fabric in the, in the central office, and so that, that gives us enough hardware to be able to do what we need to do. Um, so we would have seen in the earlier talks that Cord has this uh, service composition controller uh, that we call XOS. Um, and XOS allows us to define uh, different services um, and also how those get composed together. And so in, in our code, we have our, the, service, the functions that I just talked about, the VLT, the VSG, and the VRider, and we define them as services inside of XOS. Um, and then every residential subscriber that connects to the code uh, pod will get an instance of these services. Um, so for example, uh, for the VSG service, an instance of the VSG will be a container that runs on, on the compute nodes. Um, and one of the key points here is that uh, we can combine uh, seamlessly control plane services and data plane services. So uh, the, control, the blue services that we see in the diagram are control plane services that run uh, on, on top of ONOS, and the red services are data plane services which run as VNFs on the compute infrastructure. And so now that we've seen uh, what services we have inside of uh, our code, we can, we can then uh, take a, a step down and see how those fit onto the uh, code architecture. So we would have seen a picture like this uh, in earlier presentations as well, um, which is showing the hardware and software architecture of Cord. Um, in the bottom we have our, our Rexit commodity x86 uh, servers. Uh, those are interconnected by a open uh, least by uh, switching fabric, which is um, open flow controlled, and the control is, is living uh, on top of our house. Um, we have our, on the left here, we have our white box OLT devices, which are plugged into the fabric, um, and obviously the access lines going down to the subscribers. And then on the other side, we, our, our metro routers are connected into the fabric, uh, and, and that's the path up to the backbone network and up to the internet. And then at a software level, we have obviously on us. We have the control software running on top of on us, um, both for controlling the infrastructure and for controlling the networking services such as the VLT and the VRider. And then above that is the, the uh, ultimate uh, core uh, service controller. And then we can see how we have our services that get deployed uh, on the uh, computer infrastructure. So here we're showing the VLT, the CDN, and the, and the VSG services. Okay. And so now I want to uh, take a look at um, the, each of these different types of services. Um, and the first one is uh, the, the VLT service um, and how we disaggregate the VLT uh, using this, this piece of software called Volta. So, yeah, like I said before, uh, legacy OLT devices are closed proprietary boxes with lots of uh, control functionality inside of them. Um, and in core, what we want to do is pull that software out and, and split it into different layers, right? So at the bottom layer, we have our white box OLT. So these are, these, these are pieces of hardware that contain just the switching chip and, and basically do the, the physical and Mac layer of, of, the, uh, of the pod system. All of the higher level functionality that usually would reside in the OLT has been pulled out into either the VLT agent or on us. Um, and the point of the VLT agent is to um, basically handle all of the pond specific uh, things. So we don't want to put all of that inside of ONOS, um, but we have this, this separate agent which uh, provides another layer of abstraction between uh, the, the hardware and the ONOS controller. And then on top of ONOS we have applications which are uh, implementing the, the higher level networking functions. Um, so early on in CORD, uh, um, AT&T started working with uh, vendors to produce uh, white box OLTs. Um, so they worked with a vendor called PMC Sierra to, to, to build a switching, uh, the OLT chip, um, and uh, an ODM called Celestica to build a box around that, um, which is what we're showing at the bottom here. Um, and we also worked with a PMC vendor to build the Vault Agent software. Um, so in the early days of Cord, this vault agent software was, was built by a particular vendor. Um, and so this was great to be able to show that how we can disaggregate the OLT into, into different pieces and pull, pull the software out of it. 
um, but it doesn't scale well to um, multiple vendors. So, um, you know, there, there, there exists a lot of different OLT vendors in the industry, um, such as Kellex, Sienna, Tibbet, uh, Nokia, and Atran. Um, and we, we still want to be able to leverage the principles of, of disaggregation and pull the, and, you know, separate out the control functionality, even with these vendors. Um, and so there's a, there was a large desire in the industry to um, kind of build out a common uh, agent or, or common abstraction layer uh, that we can use to support multiple different vendors. Um, and so as part of that, um, it, around the end of last year, the, this uh, project called Volta was uh, founded um, in collaboration with uh, server providers like AT&T and OLT vendors and ONF. Um, and Volta stands for Virtual OLT Hardware Abstraction. And, and the point of Volta is basically to provide uh, this common abstraction layer, um, which can abstract the details of, of many different types of hardware, um, and also allow us to uh, handle all of the pun-specific things, um, so that OS doesn't have to handle them. <clears throat> so in the middle is the Volta Core, which is, which is uh, yeah, basically handling pun-specific things. Um, and then at the, at the southbound of the Volta Core, there's an API which allows different vendors to build their own uh, OLT adapters. Um, and this means that they can, they can write an adapter for their specific hardware um, and, and allow their hardware to work with, with Volta and ultimately with the OS control applications. Um, and then on the top is uh, Volta has many different types of uh, northbound interfaces. So it has a REST interface for, for management and control. Um, it has an open flow agent, um, and the open flow agent is important because it, it allows Volta to abstract the PON systems as a, a single open flow switch. Um, and, then, and then that's how ONOS uh, is controlling the, um, the PON. And then it also has an ACOM for configuration. And so Volta is architected around uh, modern uh, sort of cloud principles. Um, it, it doesn't run as a single monolithic application. It is, uh, it's containerized, so it has multiple different processes which each run in their own containers. They communicate with each other via gRPC, uh, and it leverages a lot of uh, off-the-shelf open source components for communication and for distributed systems. Uh, so for example, some of the ones that are shown here, uh, console for as a uh, strongly consistent backend store, um, and registrator um, to, for, to, for service discovery um, and Kafka is an event bus. Okay, so now we've seen how Volta works, and we can we can look at how we put our, our VLT service together with Volta. Um, so at the bottom we have our um, a, a new piece of hardware that we're working with, which is the Edge Core ASF Vault 16. Um, so this is built. This is based around the Broadcom uh, Maple uh, OLT chip which supports many different types of uh, PON, um, including XGS PON, which provides 10 gig uh, PON links that many service providers are looking at, de at deploying. Um, on top of that, we use Volta, obviously, to, like I said before, abstract the detail details of the PON and expose uh, the PON system as an open flow switch to ONOS. And then on top of that, we have ONOS and several control functions that are implemented uh, as ONOS applications. Um, so examples of this is we have the VOLT application, which allows us to do VLAN provisioning. Um, so every subscriber gets assigned different VLANs, and whenever a new subscriber comes along, these need to be provisioned into the OLT. Um, we have the AAA application for authentication. So when a new subscriber um, uh, turns on their CPE device, they need to authenticate with the network using 802.1x. Um, we have the multicast application for provisioning multicast VLANs uh, for IPTV. We have the DHCP relay application um, for DHCP requests, and then also IGMP snooping and, and uh, relay. Okay, so that's the, that's the VLT service, and now we'll look at um, how we disaggregate the BND uh, into the VSG and the VRIDA service. So the VSG service, uh, like I said before, stands for Virtual Subscriber Gateway. Um, and the point of this is to have a per-subscriber service where we can do any per-subscriber functionality that we want. Um, so in, in the reference implementation, this runs as a Docker container on the compute resources. 
um, and there's a separate VSG instance for every subscriber that comes to, to the system. Um, and in, in our reference implementation, we um, basically have pulled a lot of the CPU functionality out of the, of the CPU in the, in the user's home, and we implement it in the VSG. So examples of functionality are the DHCP server, the DNS relay, and even the netting is done in the VSG on x86. Um, and of course, there are many design options available here. Um, different service providers have different environments, um, and they have different requirements about what stuff needs to be done in, in the CPU device and what can be done in the cloud. Um, so it needs to be flexible to allow uh, providers to, to choose which, what kind of services they want. And then the final service that we have is the vRider. Um, so uh, we can see on the right-hand side of the diagram we have uh, our leaf spine fabric connecting to Metro riders um, upstream. Um, and in order to be able to exchange traffic with the Metro network, we need to be able to speak routing protocols. Um, so to that end, we leverage uh, Quagga, which is an open source uh, routing stack. We deploy it on our compute nodes, um, and then we version Fos to allow um, Quagga to, to communicate with Metro routers using router protocols, um, such as OSPF and BGP. So Quagga will learn um, uh, the routes from the Metro network, it will send them to the vRouter control application, um, which will then communicate with the fabric control and provision uh, the fabric to allow routes to, to pass. Um, and from that time, uh, any services in the core pod are able to communicate with the upstream network. Okay, so we've had a look at the different services that we have, um, and uh, I'll just quickly go over what we have on the roadmap for uh, our quad. Um, so the first thing is to, is to fully integrate Volta into our code um, and have it deployed automatically as part of the VLT uh, service. Um, so Volta is a relatively new project, it's just had its first release um, I think a couple of weeks ago, so um, we, we're now able to take that and bring it into our code uh, fully. Um, the second thing is we want to investigate how we can move some of the, some of the functionality we have in the VSG to uh, the hardware using programmable switches, um, P4-enabled programmable switches. Um, and examples of that are QoS services and PPPoE termination. And then finally, there's uh, a lot of work that's going to be done around multi-access edge, so combining the different flavors of cord, uh, specifically R cord and M cord, onto the same system to have them work together. Right. So in conclusion, um, R cord is disaggregating the residential broadband access um, we have three main services, which are VLT, VSG, and VRouter. Um, and the reference implementation that we have uses completely open commodity hardware, and the functions are pulled out and implemented as ONOS control applications or as VNFs. All right. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Journal. Uh, anyone have any questions for Journal about the uh, residential cord? Okay. Thanks again, Journal. Next speaker is uh, Sean Ying from at and and he's going to give us some information about Volta. Welcome. Uh, I'm Sean Yin from at and um, I'm the product owner for the Volta project. Um, thanks, John, for a detailed introduction about what Volta the architecture really is about. And I'm here to probably just describe some of the history, some of the stories, and then the, the collaboration between the, the product owners and then the community, and um, the, mostly the project management portion of the Volta project.
I think the first half of the slides I'm going very fast because uh, everybody's tired at this point. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, but uh, the goal is of Volta is you know we're going to create a common hardware abstraction software can, we can support multiple uh, access technology and provide the uh, uh, hardware and technology and vendor agnostic uh, layer and then we can work with the, the SDN controller in the north and then different hardware in the south. Um, so so the, the goal actually, I think was when we first started, I, I, I think this is public information, at the end of 2016, um, the, the Micro Semi demo that uh, John mentioned, we had a field trial on that one. Uh, that's end of uh, 2016. But uh, since then, the, 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 the bandwidth of the servers was, it, 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 back, that, back then is the GPON. So GPON is a one gig. Uh, services. So, so we would like to be able to include uh, a higher bandwidth uh, technology. So the XGS Palm uh, uh, become the de facto next technology we would like to be introduced into this uh, architecture. Uh, but not all, uh, however, the, the goal of the Volta framework doesn't really just stay on the Palm layer. Uh, it will also be able to support GDFS and GPON2. EPON and other new um, uh, or you know next gen of the the pawn technology. So I'm going to skip. Uh, we mentioned about this one that the service provided nightmare is uh, in a legacy network. Uh, the, the the hardware and the management software is provided by a single vendor, um, and then they fully integrate into our network. So in order to do changes, it takes a lot of time and money in order to change. And uh, what do we want? We want to have a common uh, access technology uh, with, the, with the hardware we pick, and whoever has the cheapest model we're gonna take. But the, the, <laughs> But the management interface and uh, and uh, uh, the controlling and management functionality will stay the same. So I think that's the that's the reason, and then that gave the birth of the Volta. Um, so this this diagram looks a little bit different than the, than John was presenting, and this actually captured the the Volta. 1.0 features. Um, so you can see uh, for Volta 1.0, we also introduced the XPON handler um, in, in the, in the right, uh, is that right hand side of, your, of, of, your, of the screen, and also XPON agent. If you can see on the bottom of the Volta, the OLT and ONT, or, or sometimes we call ONU, um, each, each different hardware, they're going to have their own adapter. So for example, we have the Micro Semi PMC adapter uh, we talked about a bit earlier. And uh, with the Volta 1.0, we actually introduced a lot more. But those, those adapters right now is, become, is part of the Volta core. Um, but in the, in the near future, I think one of the, the main goal is to make the adapters also be supported within its own container. So the service provider, you know, when they load the Volta, they can pick the, the adapter, you know, what, whatever hardware of the OLT or, or an ONU adapter they want. So you don't have to load additional drivers or software component you know, when they try to deploy Volta. Um, this, one, this one, to me right now is still a myth. It's uh, because right now we don't have enough hardware or new uh, hardware variants right now to prove this, uh, this uh, hypothesis. Is, so I, 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 when, when, when the step one, the, when OLT comes up, and it will talk to Volta, and it will go to, it will, it will be matched with the, the, Volta, uh, the OLT adapter of its own kind, and uh, once, once the OOT has been recognized by Volta, and the 
and also the, when when the ONU on the step three, when the ONU comes up, and you know there's a there's a splitter in between. The the, the palm technology is uh, you can the the single single fiber coming from the OLT can be split into different split ratio, ratios. It can be one by sixteen or even one by four, one by eight, one by sixteen, one by sixty four. One by twenty-eight. I think the for XGS palm is, is always is almost you can go one by two hundred fifty-six. Uh, so when the ONU comes up, a certain message will send up stream to the OLT, and then it will it will go through the Volta adapter, and then and then find the corresponding ONU adapter, and then they will do the interworking through the Volta core. And then the ONT will be arranged and registered. Um, so with this idea is the company A. So today most of the ONU OLT interoperability is very challenging because of each company uh, is developing their own OMCI messaging sequence or the the vehicle management element setting. So. If the OMCI uh, sequence between the ONU and OOT doesn't talk to each other, or they, they, they are talking to different sequence, it will not, uh, uh, the, 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 the whole ranging process will not, and registration will not be completed. But with the VOTA, the ONU adapter has, has the, ME, the, 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 the OMCI message information. And it will tell the OLU adapter what sequence it's been using. So the goal, the the the, the, the I, I will say the, the intent of this design is because of the kind of the uh, announce and then adjust the OLT and ONT interoperability should not be an issue anymore. Um, but right now, this is this is something we still need to, to need to verify. So, if any lab or if you guys are doing the, the in your in your lab, uh, try try to try to to prove whether a vendor A's O N T can talk to vendor B's O N T and through the Volta, I think that would be great. Uh, so. The Volta project, I'm, I'm going to tell a little bit uh, about a uh, history about the Volta project. So the project, as John mentioned, was started actually the end of, actually September of 2016. The Owen Lab accepted the Volta as a project. And it was sort of um, handled as a brigade for, uh, for the, a part of our core uh, project. So it, the, the and it consists of the Orn Lab, Sienna Blue Planet uh, unit, and also Tippet. Um, uh, they are the main contributor for 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 this uh, Volta brigade. Um, and supported hardware is you know the Tippet Micro OOT. I should be able to read that. <laughs> and uh, and the PMC, the Micro Semi uh, G Pan OOT, and Broadcom Maple based OOT. So there was a release at the end of last year, and also continue upgrade through almost uh, the, the the end of February. Um, there was certain proof of concept testing had been going on during that time, and at the after the, the proof of concept testing result, we think the scope of the Volta is much bigger than just a brigade can handle. So. Uh, at and we invited a few um, vendors and plus some other te tech technology leaders within the field. And we have a lockdown meeting and we formally uh, established the VOTA as its own project. And I, from at and uh, become a de facto product owner for VOTA project. And then we have the Donna from Redis and then Yuan took over later as the Scrum Master. And since then, so we, def we defined the release features 
and then we have three development sprint and also the framework uh, exploration process within two months period. Um, our, we, our target is that for the Volta 1.0 release was August 31st initially, and uh, and then there was certain set of the release 1.0, and I'm going to show you the the, the, the feature set in the more, uh, roadmap later. Um, also, in the in Volta 1.0, we add additional OLT and ONU combination. So we included Nokia, Atran, Calyx, and the Edge Core, uh, the, the, the 16 uh, white box. The, 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 the thing I want to bring up with Edge Core is uh, AT&T, uh, last year we announced uh, uh, OCP, New Open Compute Project uh, design for the XGS Palm OLT. And the the the, the specific, specification in the design, including the Broadcom Maple B Zero chip plus the Qumran chip. So the Edge Core device probably is the first one following the um, the, the, the 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 specification, and and then they they build it and made it available sometime June of this time. So as you can see. The hardware seems to go a little bit slower than the software that already started running. So there's a lot of racing going on during the whole process. So this is what's going on. Of the milestones we have been achieved and that is planning to meet. Um, the, the, as I said, the at and is the, is the product, uh, product owner of the Volta project since May, and then we have the major supplier, uh, the, the vendor supplier, become the technical lead within the the, the, the Volta project. Um, so in September 13, we made the release 1.0, and uh, as you can see, there's a QA testing started. There's a QA testing. Uh, process right now is going on. Um, so, 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 I, uh, the, the, the community members which contribute the code, they've been doing the QA testing and they, 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 they're trying to make sure the Volta 1.0 release will work with multiple OOT hardware. Um, the, the release 1.1 will be cut when the edge core adapter become available. Right now, the, 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 the development of the edge core adapter with the basic functionality still in progress. So hopefully, keep our finger crossed, it will be released next week. Um, and so when, when the edge core adapter available, we're going to tag the, 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 the support branch, branch as a release 1.1. And we will create a release 1.1 support branch that, that will be the Volta 1.0 plus the Edge Core uh, uh, OOT adapter. And uh, there will be a, uh, I'm trying to mention this, that in, in, uh, in the month of October 23rd, the ONF is going to bring the Volta 1.0 with the Edge Core to the Broadband World Forum, which will be in Berlin. Um, that will, I, I believe the release they're going to bring is part of the 1.0, maybe the 1.1 release. Um, there will be another release cut, will be from 1.0, uh, uh, around the October 30th. Um, they will be including all the bugs they found during the QA testing, and then we will try to release that uh, uh, as a release one X. The X is right now is to be determined. Um, but uh, so that the release um, at and is going to take to, 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 to our fourth quarter field file. This, the, uh, the HGS-PON SDN-NFV approach 
field trial was announced at the end of June. Uh, AT&T is going to take the, the, the OOT with a bow tie release and to, to be field, uh, field trial at the end of this year. And we have, on the far right, we have a release of VOTA 2.0. So right now, after this meeting, uh, this week, we're going to start doing the planning of the feature sets for the release 2.0. Any questions so far? Is it understandable? <laughs> I have to have you educating about the branch changing back and forth. Um, but, uh, oh, sorry. So, this is the mechanism regarding how to cut the releases. Uh, I, I guess I, I don't have to read that, but uh, we are expecting the uh, Edge Core OLT will be available the next week, and that will be the when the Volta 1.0 will be released and a, a support branch will be cut. Um, yeah, that's all I mentioned before. Okay, and the external visibility deliverables, as I mentioned, uh, the, the 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 things you want to notice is the broadband world forum, the the showcase of the the Volta in Berlin, uh, led by the ONF, and they are, as I said, AT and T announced the field trial, I believe the other carrier uh, in, a com in the world is going to uh, field trial the, 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 the VOTA also, which I'm not allowed to disclose at this point. Um, so our core integ integration, is that still true for the January 15th? There will be some level of integration. There will be some level of integration, okay. But to what extent is to be? Okay. Any question? Okay, this is very hard to read, but uh, when the Volta first started, it's a single standalone system. There's no high availability. And uh, so in the May time frame, we decided we need to have a, a high availability implemented in the Volta. So, um, in for Volta 1.0, they're still going to support a cluster of three Volta. I think Onos is part of that. They're using the Docker Swarm to support the uh, high availability uh, configuration. And then the next one, uh, next feature for Volta 1.0 will be the Volta installation, the Volta installer. Sometimes, some um, Understanding is you know, a lot of open software when you do the installation, the internet access actually is required. You need to access the GitHub in order to pull down the, 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 the code. But we are, I think in the real time, in the real life deploying the model, the internet access should not be required. So that's another uh, major feature in, in, indicated there. Palm management and configuration. That one was uh, the technical lead. What what was it, it was basically planning for the NetConf EM model from the problem forum. This so this is problem forum uh, WT385 mentioned in this uh, slide. Um, so so the as you can see the the punk the I think there's an expound handler in the previous uh, the diagram. Those are introduced in order to support the NetConf EM model uh, configuration from the northbound. Uh, backtrack a little bit. In the previous, uh, before the Volta 1.0, everything is nailed down. So the, uh, the, the, the ONT and ONU, which port connect to everything is basically is, is a nailed down model and also the assignment of the SVLAN, CVLAN tag. Um, but right now with this introduction, um, the, the, the assignment of the, the port assignment and also the SVLAN tag and VLAN tag assignment should be uh, able to provision based on the, the YAN model from, coming from the, from the northbound. Uh, Volta backup and restore, there's some effort on that. So uh, there will, there's some user case was created based on that. Um, Volta security. 
Uh, it is one of the uh, area. Uh, but I, I would have to say the most of the focus right now uh, for the last uh, two to three months is the high availability and the pump config to make sure we have a solid framework so it can carry us over into the Volta 2.0. And the individual company, they are uh, contributing their uh, OOT and ONT adapter that also take a lot of resource. Um, so Volta 2.0, I think I, have, I still have some time. <laughs> uh, Volta 2.0, that's a very long list. If you're a service provider here, um, I'm, I'm, I'm welcome you for your input regarding to the Volta 2.0 feature set. Um, NetCamp support, based on the broadband forum, uh, about, uh, uh, yeah, so, so the, the, the NetCamp interface on the north of the Volta will support the broadband forum YAM, common YAM model, and that's a big one. And uh, GDA Fast, we want to introduce GDA Fast as one of the uh, adapter within the Volta. And the other big one is the, we want to containerize. Where is that? The first one, actually, the, the containerized adapter. So right now, the challenge what we have is any changes we are doing on the adapter level require the whole comp re recompile the, the whole Volta, Volta core. So, because as you can see, with more technology and supplier involved with this project, the separation of the core and the adapter need to be there. So, so that, that, that is actually one of the top uh, priority for the Volta 2.0. The other one I want to mention is the Kubernetes. Um, I think we, uh, during the process of the Volta 1.0, we found that some issues is uh, uh, Docker Swarm related. So uh, the, 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 the Kubernetes integration uh, will, be, will be one of the top projects too. This one item is AT&T OMCI spec. Um, so AT&T also released the uh, AT&T's uh, specific, uh, specific, uh, specification of the OMCI messaging sequences. Um, if you go to the Volta, um, the, 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 the wiki page on the open core and the Volta project, you can see a lot of information, including that OMCI spec will be in that repository. I think the Volta 3.0, that's too far away. I'm not going to talk about it at this point. Any question? OK. So the, the target release date is Q2. The, uh, so it's right now that we have not firm up. I think right now we're saying May 31st of 2018, but depends on the resource available and the vendor and service provider can provide the timeline may switch around a little bit. But as you can see, that list is a huge list. Um, these are the features regarding to the Volta the, the, the edge core adapter to work with the Volta 1.0. So I just listed here for your reference. There are other things uh, regarding to the lesson learned in Volta 1.0. Some of the system integration testing is not transparent. Um, so, so, so we think there are some set, set, certain process and mechanisms need to be included when we working on the Volta 2.0, like CI/CD with reference from implementation of the Volta uh, and how we set up and separation of Volta adapter into separate repo. Right now, the repo, if you look at it, if you go on to the Volta site, the adapter and the and the, the, the Volta actually is in the same repository. So we need to be able to separate that. Um, Establishing the mini milestone. Um, I think right now we're looking at probably a four to six months of development time. So the mini milestone will be very important. I'm, I'm, I'm personally, I'm very in favor of the PlugFest. I think the PlugFest, everybody bring their own hardware or, and then come in and then do, a, do, a, do, do, do the testing at the same time. I, I, I think that's something uh, I'm, I'm personally. Uh, want to champion for, and I would like to have uh, other service providers input on that. 
And uh, feature planning, as I mentioned, um, probably the, we start we already start generating the list and reprioritize the, the, the list for Volta, Volta 2.0 and uh, the feature list you've already seen. And grow the community with more service provider and vendors engagement. So right now the main uh, participants for the Volta project, ONF, um, uh, Sienna, Blue, uh, Blue Planet, and uh, Atran, Nokia, Cal uh, no, sorry, the Redis and Calyx, uh, Tibet is also part of the government. So uh, we don't, we think we definitely need to have the, uh, this project, the community need to be grown in, in order to move the project forward smoothly. So these are the information. Uh, we, we have the, uh, the, the, the core dis or separate TST discussion on Tuesday and Thursday morning right now. So, so if, you have, if you're interested to participate, um, please uh, take a look at the court calendar. Uh, we may change the time zone a little bit, so we'll be more friendly to our Asian and the European friends. So that's all I have here. Uh, and I guess I almost used this 30 minutes. <laughs> I don't need that much. But anyway, so any questions? Um, I welcome for any input through the email. Uh, if you want, I can provide you with my business card later. Um, there's some of technical issues. Um, I will I welcome you to, to join the VOTA discuss of mailing list. And if you, if you have any problem, I think the, the people on the mailing list, uh, they are very, very helpful. All right, thank you, Sean. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to take a break uh, for about 15 minutes here. Uh, please be back at 4.45 when we'll be having the results of the hackathon. See you in a few minutes.
Yeah. 